Okay, good. Uh, let's uh, switch to a different, well, related topic. But uh, a year ago, we were approached at Microsoft Norway to kind of, well, by Red Cross. They had a, a serious problem uh, they wanted to tackle. So Red Cross is out in the field and helping, well, typically your third world countries they're in. And their whole thing is to be able to actually respond to crisis. So when there is an epidemic situation, they need to be able to get out to the people and save lives. And in order for them to do that, they, well, the more data they can get and the more insight into the issue, the better. So the situation, take for instance, Haiti. There's been a cholera outbreak since 2010. There's 740,000 cases, there's 8,800 deaths. So this is actually a landscape in Haiti with different communities and you'll see there's houses scattered here and there and there's no roads, right? There's no way for you to drive a car. So when they need to respond, they do by foot, right? So that can take hours. And just getting the information, so they might not even have electricity, so they're not connected to the cloud. So getting data from these places, getting to know that someone is ill, they look at not only people, but they also look at animals. Like, what's the situation with animals? Some of these carry disease that can be transferred to humans. So they look at all these kind of things. And they need to capture that data. So what uh, the Red Cross did is a couple of nurses at the Red Cross figured we have to use, well, digital technology to actually do this. So they did a project where they basically got the volunteers in the field to use, well, for the most part, SMS to actually report on incidents and what they call indicators. So they look at indicators, different types of indicators, as I mentioned, the animal indicators and things like that. So they start feeding this information back and all of a sudden they can gain insight. So what they came up with together with partners is something where they have basically a Power BI dashboard and a partner that is capable of try, kind of translating those SMSs into something that is digestible into Power BI. And voila, now they can see, right? They can actually see and respond faster because they can see trends. They can now see it's not only that single instance, they can see trends in areas and they know when and where to respond. So they deployed this, had success, came to Microsoft Norway and, and asked, well, could we help them out in building this, uh, the next version? And Red Cross is in a situation where, well, they don't have devs. They have very little IT people altogether. So they rely on help from externals. And they also have very, very little money to actually go and build this, to going to a consultancy and paying 100, 150 euros an hour is kind of off the table, right? That's too expensive. So we had to kind of go and look at how can we do this together? How can we help you guys actually achieve your goals? And these were kind of the tools they were saying that most, most volunteers were using this. This is the level of tech we have to kind of plan for. Some other Red Cross field workers will have more advanced tools, but for the most part, it's that level. So that's kind of the, the setting. So we set out and said, well, we had to have these goals. We got to define some goals. Has to be built very smart with all that context that I just gave you. Reduce the cost 
and also reduce the risk. This is a software that's going to be living, hopefully, for years. So we have to build something that is maintainable and have a high quality bar. So we are guaranteeing that the stuff that we're putting out there actually works. And they're in a time crunch. They're in a constant time crunch because Haiti is one of 105 countries they're in. They need this delivered. And that brings up the whole thing that we need to kind of, we need to be able to deliver this to new countries, spin up new countries really fast. And also, they have seasonalities for the diseases they see. So they need to be able to kind of spin up and down and actually control the whole system. And also that brings back to cost as well, because if you were to run 105 countries always running, that can become costly when there's really a lot of downtime that you can optimize for. But we also have to think about legislations, because a lot of these countries will not put medical records information in the cloud. It's not allowed by law. So you kind of have to build for that scenario as well, meaning that we, well, some of them have also very bad connectivity. So you actually cannot put anything in the cloud. You need to be doing not only the data, but also the compute in the cloud. So we had to come up with kind of an architecture. We started off talking with them, and we quickly, I'm a huge fan of kind of domain-driven design myself, been doing it for years. And it was kind of natural to start off with that, start identifying. And this is a, they have very clear bounded context. They have very clear domain, right? So let's start with the domain, understand what to build. And we also figured they're very natural for events. They have a lot of events happening. That's what they want to gain insight from. So that's kind of also a checkbox. Let's make it event driven meaning event sourcing, event stores, all these kind of things. Uh, kind of focus on reducing the risk by breaking it up, right? Remember, we had to reduce the risk. Breaking it up, we could actually have isolated applications and try to break the dependencies, decouple these applications to reduce the risk, which will allow us to have multiple teams working together, autonomous teams. Also automated, as I mentioned, we had to really think about deployment, get a new country up and running really fast, has to be, everything has to be automated. So everything from guaranteeing the quality to actually delivery has to be automated. So we decided on, well, it needs to be Docker. So right on, put it in Docker. We deploy all the images to the Docker hub and we need an orchestrator to do this, and we chose Kubernetes. I've been working for close to 10 years now on my own little open source uh, project with several others. And it was kind of natural to look at this because it was kind of capturing all the, the stuff they wanted to do and had building blocks for everything had all the event sourcing stuff that you need and all the publishing and event streaming and event stores and whatnot built into it. So it was kind of natural for us to just pick this. And going between bounded context, one of the building blocks we have in, in Doolittle is something called, we, we call a mediator. And it is capable of kind of going between the different bounded concepts because we, we want to remove friction. So Actual, in this architecture, we don't have the bounded context talk to each other over APIs even. It's all event-based. And that means someone owns events, someone produces events, and someone consumes events, basically. And the mediator sits there as a uh, multiple levels, actually. There's a, a by convention thing that automatically just maps over, and that reduces risk. Right, it's because you don't really know, need to know about the... So typically what you would have is a shared kernel maybe to have the events defined in. You really don't need that. You can actually define whatever you want to and by convention it will just automatically map over. So you define your version of the event that you want to consume. 
Uh, if you want explicitness, you can also do that. And by this model, we would be able to actually just go and say, hey, these teams don't need to know about each other. They only need to know about kind of events. And events are much easier to version as well, because if you, well, you don't necessarily version them. Because if you introduce new meaning, that means there is a new meaning into the domain, which means a new type of event, not necessarily a change on an existing event. So it makes it a lot easier to actually do this. So I want to just quickly show also one of the benefits that you get out of this. And of course, it's not mirroring because that would be too easy. So what you're looking here uh, is one of the tools that we've created for this whole thing. And this is a different project altogether, but it shows all the different events in this particular project where I can go in and say, let me see temperature decreased. And what you'll see over here is basically all the events uh, that I filtered down to. And I can go and sort this by occurred and also get it like this, where I can uh, start doing drill drill downs. And this is super helpful for, for, for them. So imagine text messages coming in where you can actually drill down to this level. And of course, when you click one of these, you get details about the event related to that, all the metadata and all the, all the stuff that you would need. So this is kind of one of the big things where you can actually also see, since there's a bunch of different events, you can start looking at correlation. So you would have multiple different types of events together and start looking at correlation like this. One of the features that would also we haven't enabled yet is to actually get this geographically as well and see those events scattered around. So with all that, we kind of felt we're, we're really good on the architecture level to actually tackle the reducing risk problem, which was massive, and also maintainability. Everything is broken up. We identified, actually they, they identified. Red Cross already had identified the bounded context, and we added a few more. But these were the bounded context that they had defined before we got there. And it was very clear. They had like documentation saying, this is that module of the system, that's the other module. And we identified that as separate actors using these and ubiquitous languages within them. So kind of a bird's eye perspective on the whole thing is that we, we have a front end and it's also based on Angular for those in an office, right? Because we need multiple different clients. So this is an example of the, from the front end perspective of that. And we have API endpoints and kind of, okay, take the front end for instance. We don't necessarily need a Docker image or a server even hosting them. We can put them on a CDN. We bundle everything up and just put it on a, on a CDN. And for the API endpoints, well, basically there are two things, because this is a CQRS-based system. So there you have your commands and your queries. That's the two things that you would be doing. And we can also, with this model, since everything is stored as events in the event store, that's the truth. We can then have different materialized views. We can also use things like Elasticsearch, I remember I kind of joked a little bit about caching earlier today. This would be a perfect cache because I know, now know when to invalidate the cache. I also know when to invalidate, a, say, a search index. So that's also kind of the benefit of this type of model. Uh, important for us was the process. So how do you do this? They don't have devs. They don't have IT. How, how do we actually build it? How do we get this done? Well, Red Cross are good at volunteer work. So why don't we try to do this in the community? Do it open source. Do it as a volunteer work, but different volunteers. It's devs scattered around, developers. Do it on GitHub and hold these 
community stand-ups where we basically, similar to what the ASP.NET team has been doing for a couple of years now, where they have regular meetings, basically live stream, where you're talking about what's next and, and kind of the backlog of things to create the community. We also identify that we need a core team. We need someone to actually own, say, from the product perspective, the actual backlog and prioritize it. Because we as devs don't have any clue what to be first, what to build first, what's the MVP for this type of product. But we also needed technical people in that core team. So we said we need at least two persons. We ended up on five. This is awesome. People are responding very positive to this whole thing. And we have five people. And that's, we can take on more because that's important. We have to be sustainable over time. And people are doing this on a volunteer basis on their spare time. So obviously, well, the more the merrier in this scenario. Everything needed to be documented, and it is. Everything is documented through, well, issues on GitHub, and very detailed on every issue, what is needed. But also what we did is put in a, a kind of a framework for how to build real documentation. So there's a documentation folder in the repository, and all markdown. We're actually using the, the docfx to generate HTML that we will put up on a site, make it publicly available. So we also wanted to be guaranteeing the quality. So whenever we got a pull request, obviously we ran a build, ran all the tests, all that stuff. That is all now in place, but also generate the documentation continuously. And that's, uh, we have one guy who's working on that right now. And, but also create all the container images and publish these to the registry as we go. So we can deploy at any time. We take a lot of, took a lot of inspiration from Humanitarian Toolbox in the US. This is Richard Campbell's little baby, for you, if you have heard of .NET Rocks. So Richard Campbell on .NET Rocks. He's been doing Humanitarian Toolbox, and I had a chat with him. And he guided me through what they've been doing, and basically wanted to learn from them. Because it would be silly when there's someone who's been doing this before to not learn from them. So that's what community is all, all about. We had a codeathon at the end of September. 42 people showed up for an entire weekend. We had actually, there's not 42 people in this picture, but we had actually 42 people on the Sunday. Uh, but this is at the end of the day. And we didn't have, well, some, some left home. But this is just awesome. This proves that people who are devs can, well, want to contribute to something like this. And of course, you're free to join if you want to. Uh, this is not a Norway project. This is actually grounded in Red Cross Foundation. So uh, you're very welcome to join. It would be awesome. We have a guy in Texas who's contributing code to this. And you'll see we're getting to a point where we actually have a pretty cool community standing, 959 commits. That's four days ago. It's, it's actually much more now. So uh, I committed code yesterday. So it's like, yeah, there's stuff going on, and it's on a day-to-day -day basis. A lot of contributors, a lot of forks. Things are happening around this. Uh, we also have on our site, we have all the stuff that's going on. You can see the builds, all the tests, all the stuff. Um, we're building it on multiple environments like Windows and obviously Linux because we're targeting Linux containers on top of Kubernetes. Technology-wise, it's using .NET uh, Core uh, on the back end and uh, TypeScript for, for the front end stuff together with Angular. Uh, we also came up with this uh, little thing. So you'll find on GitHub, you'll find a board where you can see events uh, being produced by the different bounded contexts, making it a lot easier for you to actually figure out if you need to consume one of these events, all of a sudden you have a place to go and find the events and how they look like. 
one of my colleagues, uh, she's not here, uh, but uh, Caroline has been uh, awesome in getting this community working and getting it up and engaging with it and actually having, so she's interacting with the community on an hourly basis, I think. She's uh, really into this. And she's been lucky enough by our employer, Microsoft, to actually have up to one day a week dedicated to this project, which is really, really cool. Even though she has, that's not what she does. She's not a dev that can be hired for anything. She's, but she loves it and talked to her manager and got it 